Roe is not the only abortion case that is percolating in the 1970s. Another case that's percolating in New York is Abramovitz versus Lefkowitz, right? This is a challenge brought by feminist lawyers against the state of New York's restrictive abortion law. And what's interesting about this case is that they're arguing about the right to privacy as enunciated in Griswold versus Connecticut, but they're also arguing other things. They argue that the prospect of compelled pregnancy violates the Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment. They're arguing that abortion bans disproportionately impact communities of color and the poor. So they're making race equality arguments and class equality arguments. And then they're arguing that abortion laws are a species of sex discrimination because they consign women to motherhood, a particular social role. Again, echoing Myra Bradwell and they don't permit deviation from that role. So they're basically arguing the kitchen sink here, all kinds of different arguments, and they're not alone in this. Another case that's percolating at the time is called Strzok versus Secretary of Defense, and this is being litigated by Rutgers Law Professor Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who is also working with the ACLU's Women's Rights Project at the time. And she thinks Strzok is exactly the right case to bring the question of reproductive rights to the United States Supreme Court. Susan Strzok is a captain in the Air Force during Vietnam, and she's unmarried, and she finds herself pregnant. She's also an ardent Catholic, and she does not want to terminate this pregnancy. Instead, what she wants to do is bring this pregnancy to term, deliver the child, surrender it for adoption, and then go back to her job. But the military's policy, the federal policy at the time, demands that in order to keep her job, Susan Strzok has to have an abortion or she has to leave the military. Think about that. The federal policy at the time requiring someone to terminate a pregnancy. Ginsburg thinks this is the perfect case for the court because it makes clear that reproductive rights is not simply about avoiding a pregnancy, but rather exercising your reproductive liberty on your own terms. And more than that, this case makes clear that reproductive rights implicates employment discrimination, pregnancy discrimination, religious freedom. There's a panoply of different issues here. And she thought this is the one. The military probably thought this was the one too because they immediately changed their policy, <laughs> mooting the case. Abramovitz and Lefkowitz versus Abramovitz also met the same fate. New York repealed its restrictive law, passed a more liberal law, and both of those cases are basically out of the running to reach the Supreme Court. And then there was one man standing, Roe versus Wade, which came out of Texas. And it was litigated by two young lawyers, Sarah Weddington and Linda Coffey, who are about three years out of the University of Texas Austin Law School. And they don't argue sex equality. They don't argue class equality. Again, they're not in conversation with some of these other litigation efforts. We, we just aren't as connected as we are today. Right? And this wasn't, there wasn't a movement around this as there was, for example, around marriage equality that would coordinate all of these efforts. Instead, they argue privacy because that's what's worked in their jurisdiction. All politics is local, all litigation is local too. A few years before they file their case in Roe versus Wade, there has been a challenge to a sodomy law in Texas. And it's actually successful in invalidating the sodomy law at the district court level using the right to privacy. It doesn't get much further than the district court, but at the district court, it's successful. And so they say, this works here. This is what we're going to argue. And this is the case that makes it to the court. And I say this just to make clear that our imagination around reproductive rights is focused on privacy. But there was a moment where everything was on the table and our legal imaginations were unbounded by what reproductive rights meant and what constitutional principles it might have implicated. Roe versus Wade is decided by the court in 1973. Harry Blackman, a Nixon appointee, writes the opinion for a seven to two court. The dissenters are William Rehnquist, another Nixon appointee, and Byron White, a Kennedy appointee. So both bipartisan support for the decision and bipartisan opposition with those two justices. It makes clear that there is a constitutional right to terminate a pregnancy before viability, usually marked at around 23 weeks in pregnancy. And it offers a sort of broad 
calendar for when the state can intervene. So first trimester, state can't tell a woman what to do. She, in consultation with her physician, has the right to terminate a pregnancy. In the second trimester, the state's interests begin to be perfected and it can restrict abortion for particular reasons, like the women's health or for other safety concerns around medical licensing or professional licensing. And then in the third trimester, this is when the state's interests are truly perfected and it can prescribe abortion entirely. Right? When it's announced in 1973, Roe is not immediately controversial. It actually doesn't even merit an above the fold mention in the New York Times or indeed in any national paper. What actually dominates the headlines is the death of former President Lyndon Baines Johnson. But even in the aftermath of 1973, it takes a while for backlash to row to build. It's actually pretty much under the radar for a while. But then it all changes in the late 70s and early 1980s where there is considerable backlash to row. And a lot of this is fomented around a project of political realignment within the Republican Party where the Republican Party, seeing that they have made some enormous gains in the post-Civil Rights Act world in the South, thinks about how it might extend those successes in other parts of the country, particularly in the upper Midwest and in New England. And abortion, they identify as a wedge issue that will drive New England Catholics and individuals in the upper Midwest and will also galvanize this newly emergent political constituency of Christian evangelicals in the South. So it becomes a kind of perfect storm, a way to solidify electoral gains, but also to expand them.